Hi everyone and welcome to Preparing for Launch where we have a chat about the space sector through entertainment, education, advice and insight. Today we have a very special guest, Dr. Helen Sharman, here to speak about her journey in time and space. After graduating with a PhD in chemistry from Burbank University, she started working at the Mars Confectionery on the flavor of chocolate, unaware of the huge twist in her career that was in her future. She applied to Project Juno and was picked out of 13,000 applicants, launching in May 1991 to become the first British astronaut, the first woman on the Mars space station, and an inspiration to us all. After eight days in orbit, she returned to Earth and is now here with me to tell us all about it. Minus X minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hi, Dr. Sharman. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, it's my pleasure. And I'm just delighted that you asked, especially at this time, because I now have um, some time during this time of, let's say, of, of us all not doing the work that we had intended to do a few months ago. <laughs> it, um, it gives me the opportunity. So thank you. My, I was very lucky in, in that I was in the right place at the right time for that particular mission, because, of course, you're right, most astronauts fly as career astronauts so by the time they've done an, a sort of a higher degree and a bit of ex work experience and well, general a few years in, in industry or whatever and then they've joined uh, a space agency as it usually is and then they've done their general training and eventually they get mission assigned and then that mission's cancelled and postponed and blah 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 then of course it is usually in their 40s that they get to fly but mine was a complete one off so if you like I was mission assigned at the get-go so it was you know a fantastic opportunity and something that I didn't need to have been you know um, sort of done all of the, the generic things first like the, the generic training or that even the higher degree wasn't a requirement um, because this was just a very specific mission and they knew what it was you know what the requirements were going to be for that so yeah it was um, um, life is going to change again and uh, there'll be all sorts so I think that's the exciting thing right now when we think about you know the SpaceX flight has not long since um, launched um, right as we're speaking at the moment we've got two SpaceX astronauts on ISS um, so, um, yeah, we're very much hoping that, of course, they will get back to Earth safe and sound, and then that will release NASA to have yet more flights. Now, you know, SpaceX has got the potential to have seven seats in its Crew Dragon capsule. It's likely that NASA and other space agencies will probably want to buy four at a time. But, you know, that releases some an extra three seats. It could be cargo. It could be three people. Now, you know, who, who will buy those seats? It could be another space agency, but it could be your research institution. You know, it could be your company who wants to send you into space to do work for your company. And that's, I think, where it gets very exciting because um, the access to space, not just to talking about the cost, but the actual access for, let's say, for normal people who are doing normal researchy kind of jobs. You don't have to be a career astronaut. It's going to be much more available. Um, yeah, that's fabulous. And would you go if you could? Actually, all my friends ask me this, but I'm actually afraid of elevators. So to be honest, I don't know if I would have the guts to be isolated in the capsule, kind of that concept. So you never know, but if I was, if I had the opportunity, I would, I couldn't say no. I don't think I would go into the training, like I said before, like to go into the commercial aspect of it and kind of have your year of, of training in life to live to be an astronaut. I don't think I would do that because I'm just not capable. Everyone knows me, I was not be able to do that. But if it was just, I had an opportunity and someone offered it to me, I would completely. Hopefully, by the time I don't know if I'm 19 now and space space travel is, is a thing in 60 years, I would go. I would I would have to go. It would be the coolest thing just to walk on the moon and just or Mars, whatever it is that just or just orbit the Earth is just the ultimate. What's the point of travel after you've done that? That's like you're set for life. <laughs> it's like that cool. elevator business. So is it, is exactly. the doors closing? Is it like at the closet or something? It's not. I'm not claustrophobic. It's just. When you know you can't get out, I was stuck a moment when I was little for like six hours, so that's what it does to you. But so I'm just kind of not in the mood to be like in tight spaces. But if I knew I was, I could get out, then I'd be fine. Then it'd yeah. be like, okay, and this works. You're trained in it and you kind of, you become very accustomed. You know, we spend hours in these simulators, so it does just feel like a second home. 
and of course you can't open the door and get out out but it's um um yes i suppose you could argue it's i mean we can't get out of the earth in in that respect so you might be able to walk out of your house but there is we, there are limits to where we can all go um so yeah, yeah. I think as long as we when we when we understand the technology of the whole thing it becomes much more easy to cope with i think and if it's become the regular, like planes, I guess when you aviation first started, everyone was like, oh my gosh, why would you go into a plane? That's crazy. That's so weird. And But now it's that's a thing and it's fine. But speaking of kind of what you wanted to do it, when you saw the advertisement for Project Juno, how did you decide you wanted to go for it? It was just a, yeah, might as well. Or did you, what did you think? How did you apply for that? So a, a while ago now, of course, but it's um, I, I, from memory as I, as I was listening to um, to the opportunity. Um, it was describing how you know, this was a chance for people from Britain to train in the Soviet Union. And this was then, you know, just towards the end of communist Soviet Union times, the Berlin Wall was still there. And so the Soviet Union seemed incredibly exotic and um, unattainable, really, uh, very different. Yeah. And so I was thinking, you know, wow, you know, what an opportunity to go and live there. And then it was talking about um, to train, of course, with the cosmonauts goodness I never thought about that wouldn't it be fabulous to be um, living amongst these people and to be learning about the technology of the spacecraft and the science you know because of course I'm chemistry is my subject so I'm just I love finding out about any aspect really of science but if it's to do with um, something that was as a sort of unattainable to me as science in space that was whoa all the experiments you could do in space and to learn about that and then of course thinking about the rest of the training the physical training and then learning the russian language the jobs that you can have in normal everyday life that involve such a variety of things language physical training you know technology science as well as living in another country you very rarely have the opportunity to have such a varied job and so actually for me it was the training and the job being all of this variety in one that really captured my imagination um i didn't think for one minute that i'd get chosen chosen to go into space or chosen to do the training but it was just yes you know what training would be absolutely amazing let's go for it yeah. what was your friends and family's reaction to this um they thought i was joking um, I, I, I knew they would. I mean, I remember I used to, I was living in a flat in London. I used to phone my, my parents every week. And um, went, once I'd applied, I told my mum, you know, I applied for this job of being an astronaut. And she just thought I was joking. She laughed down the phone. And, um, and then uh, I decided I probably wouldn't tell anybody else for a while. And I started to get picked for the, um, the selection process. So I had to tell some of my colleagues at work. And, um, and they laughed as well. And I think partly if they laughed because it was just such a, um, a different, such a weird thing to think about, and they, they hadn't for themselves considered it, they hadn't thought yeah. about it. But it was also, I mean, I, I wondered, were they laughing at me for being so audacious to even consider it? Um, or were they just nervous at the idea that, oh, well, actually, why haven't they thought about it either? Um, I it was a whole load of combination of things. Um, but yes, I think it w wasn't until um, it became a bit more widely known that this about the mission and the selection process and that I was one of, you know, in the end, sort of say 30 or so people who were left in, the, in that process, that uh, people started to take it a bit more seriously. Wow. Were you passionate about spaceflight and astronomy before or was it more chemistry? How did, or how did that work? Did you just think, oh, it's cool or... So space was just never on the agenda for me. You know, growing up in Britain in the 1960s, 1970s, um, we did school projects on Apollo. And uh, <laughs> in the 1970s, there was the, um, yeah, the Apollo-Soyuz link up. And so you know, then I was a teenager and we got all very excited about, um, oh, well, you know, isn't this going to be the, the saviour of the Cold War and everything's going to be fine after Apollo-Soyuz? You know, of course it wasn't. Um, but there was... That was all for me. It was other people did that. It was amazing and fantastic, but it was never going to be in my life. So, you know, it was the military, the macho, fast jet pilots, the, um, you know, the right stuff kind of people. Um, they were my perception of the kind of astronauts um, that, that we had. So, yeah, for me, um, I, I did normal things because nobody in my country had ever gone into space. Nobody in my family was in the military or the space industry. So it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't on the agenda. And I just got on with my life as a scientist. Loved science. I mean, I didn't know about, about engineering when I was at school. And perhaps had I done so, maybe I might have applied to do engineering. But um, as it was, I knew a bit about science, enjoyed it. 
chemistry well you know what very pragmatic I could go biological I could go physical so I plumped for if you like that middle science <laughs> um, but <laughs> didn't really know what I wanted to do um yeah but I had to pick something I think it's very young is it when you're uh, sort of at the age of what 17 maybe even younger when we're asked to choose our university subjects um I think it's really tough to make that decision that's going to really affect the rest of your life isn't it I mean how did you choose mm. physics for instance well, actually, it's a little story. So I always, I was going to do English at first, because that did not last. And then when I applied, I applied for aerospace engineering. And because I was very passionate about R, I almost did R A level, love it. And then love physics, so that engineering is kind of the bridge between that. And it's, I want to work on space flight missions. I want to do aerospace engineering, all that. But then I realized I'm just not that great at maths. I can do physics maths, but just, I don't like maths when it's just pure maths. Maybe engineering is not my thing. And then spoke to some teachers about it, and they're like, yeah, do astrophysics. And then astrophysics, the whole thing. And then got to university, realized, oh, I want to do physics. I love astronomy and astrophysics so much, but I miss just electromagnetism and circuits and mechanics and just everything. I, I, love, I love astronomy, but I wanted to do something more broad. I didn't want to just do astrophysics. I didn't want to go into research. I wanted to do nuclear physics and just everything. I, I miss chemistry, actually. So I wanted to do some chemistry and physics. And I just wanted to do an overall like bigger degree than that. And yeah, I just miss A-level physics and thought, okay, I just I love astronomy, but I don't want to do the really detailed astrophysics for four years. And that's how I got into physics. So yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> it was a path. Um, our lives are kind of quite convoluted. And if we look back over them, um, try to draw a line from where we started to where we've come and the decision making process. And, and the, the older we get, I think the more complex that becomes because there are far more um, sort of pulls and, um, and, tr and inputs to our lives. Um, but um, I know it's, it's great. Uh, we're often told you've got to sort of have a dream and you know, aim for that and don't get deflected, never get distracted from that because that's the only way to get what you want. But actually, um, if we don't get sometimes distracted by these opportunities that come our way, that we've discovered about something that we didn't know about before, then, then we, will, we, we could miss out on so much. So I think it's important to have some sort of a, um, a path on which we're traveling, but to realize that that end destination may ultimately not be what we actually do want in the end and going about life in other ways, we can become probably more fulfilled um, than if we just stuck to one single set of tracks. That's very reassuring to know because I don't really know what I want to do in four years time. So that's good to know. But... As well, you know in four years time, it'll be different to what it is now. And if you think in 34 years time and 44 years time, when you're, you know, you're further down in your career, we've got no idea, have we, what life is going to be like oh. and what the needs of science, engineering, industry, or, or research, what it's all about. Um, so I think we have to be flexible with our lives because it's changing more than it ever has done, you know. If you had any advice for younger listeners in university, what can you give them if they want to kind of work in the space sector? So I think it, it is really just that there is you know, so many opportunities. You don't have to have followed this specific path. However, <laughs> STEM subjects, it doesn't really matter which ones actually, but STEM subjects in general are just absolutely fab because with those you can then move and understand, move into mm -hmm. others and easily understand them. So you might study biology, but end up doing mm -hmm. something to do with, I don't know, some uh, perhaps in, in biomechanics and become an engineer. Yeah. Um, uh, I, in chemistry departments there are people who are physicists and life scientists and engineers and they're working in academic departments that are not if you like their own subjects so I think it doesn't really matter what you study so long as you study something that you really do enjoy because then you yeah. can you'll do well at it and you will want to find out more about it and you will want to also use it in other aspects of your life so I think that's the thing is just to think what, what is his that you enjoy doing um, to try and do a STEM subject if you want to be involved in the space industry but of course you know there's going to be uh, all sorts of opportunities for translators still um, you yeah. know Google Translate is pretty great um, there's <laughs> going to be communicators you know, we need comm specialists um, marketeers uh, a whole load of you know, just general business uh, and managers so the space industry is made up of all these people of course but the actual you know the people involved if you like at the coal face i think still are going to need you know science engineering maths possibly but a, pr a practical subject um which involves some logical understanding so if i say a techie kind of subject i don't necessarily mean it but you know what i mean it's sort of one of those stem subjects and um, yeah the world is our oyster i mean who would have known before we'd all heard of COVID-19. Um, how, how many of us had actually heard of um, um, math, what are they called? Um, the modelers, the biological modelers. 
can't remember the actual specific term, but the basic the, the, the mathematicians that, that deal with yeah. all the all the, um, yeah. the the transmission and so on. These are these are mathematicians, but they need to know biology. So you need that combination of maths and biology. Now, when I was um, at school, everybody said, "Oh, well, you know, you can do biology without maths." Because if you want to do physics, of course, you need maths for that. But, yeah, you yeah. do. So you know, but the, if you liked biology and maths, but you didn't really like chemistry much, well, that wasn't really seemed to be a good combination of subjects. But now. Oh yes, <laughs> you're in great demand now. So I think it is, it's, this is it. We just need to um, to adapt to how the world is changing um, and use our skills in whatever situation might become apparent. But yeah, it's it's exciting. You know, there's going to be so many things become available. It's changing so quickly. Oh, it's exciting. I am so grateful and lucky every day that I know I found my love so much. I've known I wanted to do this since I was like 10 watching Apollo 13 for the first time. So I think I'm just really lucky that I found my subject. Even through school in sixth form, I was like, I just love physics so much. I'm so happy that I have this. It was just my little special little place. Yeah. <laughs> my happy place. I, I love it. 13 is my favorite movie of all time. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I obsess. I actually am... Um, little story that's how I kind of my love for astronomy shifted into space flight and I did my EPQ project on Apollo 13 interviewed Jim Lovell <gasps> for it oh what a and lovely man he is isn't he he's have you met him uh, yeah yes yeah yeah but not very recently I have to say but uh but a, a, a while back yeah we did sort of yeah. the astronauts are all friends <laughs> yeah, yeah lo lovely man he, and, uh, yeah what a, he's what, amazing. what a mission to have been through um yeah oh, you know he, um, I don't think he flew after that did he into space no, it was his last mission. Oh, that's oh, an incredible story. That's oh, it's my favorite. So, why do you think you were chosen for the mission? What skills do you think helped you in the selection process? So, they were looking at um, uh, the sort of the basic sort of psychological normal people. So, they don't don't want people yeah. terribly excitable, terribly depressive. Uh, they won't really want team players. They're really looking. For yeah. Are the people who are going to be flexible? Sometimes will lead. Sometimes will be led. Um, so, we'll, you know, work collaboratively within a team and um uh, yeah just just not try and be um be, be the be the one that shouts the loudest all the time i think um but equally yeah. not to be the quietest so you know, just just normal regular kind of people but i think particularly it's um it it's that um that just sort of that, that that's i would say it being normal it's it's a question of yes yes they want to sort of a normal physique so they, we needed to be healthy if you're healthy you can train yourself to be reasonably fit so uh, the medical side of things because they did have a lot of people to choose from um they could choose people who were like bang in the middle of all the normal ranges of all the things that they were checking us out for you know extra systolic beats of our hearts for instance um but but it's that sort of that just general psychological profile um, I'm an introvert naturally, um, but I'm very happy to um, behave, let's say, or to to um, to put myself in situations where I need to be an extrovert. But I know that basically, um, if I were to just to revert to my normal self, it will be an introvert kind of character. But if I live my life completely as an introvert, I would never get up on a stage and talk. Um, I would never be able to put myself in front of a TV camera. Um, I would never have put myself actually in a selection process to become an astronaut. So I think it's that sort of almost that recognition of, of where we are and being, just being comfortable with our own selves, really, um, so that I don't always have to show off or, um, yeah. you know, tr try and be something that I'm not. Um, and I, I found it very difficult to second guess what they were looking for in the selection process. In the end, I just decided to just answer honestly, because that's the only thing I, I then could do. And, um, and yeah, and, uh, and hope for the best. That's a good point, actually. That's the only thing you can do in interviews is answer honestly. Kind of just trust the process. I think, <laughs> just... yes, it, part of it is that if, if you're in an interview and... Um, you, you are rejected for whatever reason, then somebody else was going is, is very likely to be better at that job than you. You might have just messed up on the day, but usually interviewers are very good. They can tell if you're really nervous. Um, mm. And actually, it's their fault if they don't put you at your ease. But usually, <laughs> <laughs> but we're always nervous in interviews, aren't we, all of us? But it's um, it is it's very much this question of making sure that um, that you you do of course put across what you want to. So always, I think, you remember in an interview, if there's something you want to say. If you're lucky, the interviewer will ask ask you to say that already. But if you get to the end of the interview and you haven't had a chance to say something, it's you know quite reasonable to say, "Oh, before I go, I did just want to let you know that." Hmm. Whatever it is, it's yeah. quite a reasonable thing to do. Now, um, it, it's it, they will the interviewers will likely to have asked you everything that they want, but you know it doesn't do any harm always just to have that thing that you you know you want to say. And quite often at the end of an interview, you'll be asked, "Is there anything that?" Um, 
you want to tell us that you haven't been asked and then yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> she, this is my time. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is it. So, but yes, but the, the honesty bit, yes, you're absolutely right. If, if you're not going to be good for the job, then you don't want the job. And actually, yeah. as a sort of an interviewee, you don't really know very much about that company or that job until you've actually been in the company. Um, how can you? So if you're not chosen, it probably is a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Something else, and um, the best thing is, of course, that we don't don't get bent out of shape about those rejections, and um, and we all get rejected. I've been rejected for jobs. You know, we all get rejected for jobs. Um, so it's just a question of okay, fine. Um, I really wanted that. I'm disappointed, but there are more jobs out there, um, and you know, there's um, you more likely find one that suits you far better, and um, that you'll be far happier in um, than, than the one that you just missed. What was your initial reaction when you found out you were chosen? Were you shocked? Were you kind of scared? Of what was going through your mind at that time? It felt quite surreal. We'd been brought back from the Soviet Union to a hotel in London. Um, and we were told, Tim and I were both told separately in our individual hotel rooms and then <sighs> asked to go down just to meet with the mission managers in the hotel bar downstairs. I think they'd hired a little room um, so it could be private. Um, and I, I couldn't quite believe it. I think I always assumed that Tim Mace would be chosen, not me. But even then, it was three months before the launch date, I didn't know it would be me because if I'd you know, become sick or you know, become injured before the mission, then Tim would have flown as my backup. So you don't really know until the day of the launch. Yeah. But because it was the night before the press conference, I wasn't allowed to tell anybody. So it didn't really feel real until the next day when we'd had the press conference and I could just talk to my family and friends about it. Um, then I kind of knew I was prime at least but even then, like I said, it, it, it might not have been me on the day. So you don't really know. Um, we just have to carry on with the training and the rest of it. And um, yeah, um, but at least then I had a bit more of a surety that it could be me at least. Wow. What was it like being launched in the rocket? That's kind of the point where you knew it definitely was oh, you. Yes. Is it like what you see in movies? Do you, did you feel that, that energy, momentum, just the rocket launch? I just, I don't know. How is that? So Yes, yeah, so the launch is very exaggerated on um, uh, when you see it in the movies, of course, because um, they want to big it up. Uh, and we're used to seeing the movies of Apollo and of Shuttle, which did have quite a lot of vibration anyway. Um, having said that, Soyuz, you know, it's in three stages. So it's lumpy and bumpy. Um, there's a, a, um, a fairing that has to be jettisoned once we're out of the atmosphere. So you hear the bang, you feel that bump as it goes. Um, um, as, as the rocket is getting lighter, because of course you're burning up the fuel. So as, as that is, the mass of the fuel is diminishing, the mass of the, the rocket is therefore diminishing. So the acceleration can increase. And then when you jettison a rocket stage, um, Sometimes there's a, um, a, between the first and second stages, there's, there's no gap because they, they, they work simultaneously and the first, the outside boosters are just jettisoned. The second stage just continues to work. But then when that second stage is jettisoned, there is a fraction of a second, and I can't remember, it must be around about half a second or so before the third stage kicks in. So there is um, a, a, a quick um, reduction of G in that half a second. Uh, it doesn't go to zero, but we do feel as though absolutely that acceleration is, is, is reduced hugely. Um, and there is this feeling as though we're about to feel weightless, but then of course the third stage kicks in. Um, yeah, and, you know, three and a half G is the maximum during launch. So, you know, it's not huge. We, we did eight G in centrifuges in the training, but never quite for sort of um, in, in this exact situation when you are actually launching, you've got all of this stuff going on around you. Um, but no, it's, um, it, it's exactly as all the textbooks told me it was, or the trainers told me. So I, I, you know, I could remember my profile of G versus time. Um, and so there were no surprises. Um, just a bit bumpy and a bit noisy. And um, yeah, and then when the final stage is jettisoned, of course, you go from quite a few G to zero G um, instantaneously. Um, and it's, well, not quite instantaneous, but very, very quickly. Um, and then you, you're still strapped into your seat, but of course no longer feeling weight at all. And you forget what it's like to sit down unless you are actually strapped in. You know, it's a, it is just the most natural, relaxing feeling, feeling weightless. That is incredible. Do you ever speak about other astronauts? Like, oh, do you remember when you felt this weightlessness feeling or this or that, or just kind of, do you ever bond over the feelings that you had? Um, I think we all just know what those feelings are, so we don't really discuss them per se. Um, I think with the the, um, the discussions that we have are, are more along the lines of um, 
of, of the future and how we can um, you know how we can make medicine better how we can make the safety better um, what else can we do in space how can we communicate it better um, but yeah I think we just always assume that we we know what that feeling is I guess it's a good point though you don't talk about it if you've already experienced it but can you talk about the purpose of your Soyuz mission the aims so my particular mission was, I mean, the, the actual aim of me being there was to create the first yeah. British astronaut. So to put Britain on the map of international yeah. human space flight. Um, Definitely. In, as part of going, um, I was very keen that it wasn't going to be, if you like, a wasted flight, that there was some use going to come out of it and that therefore experiments yeah. were done. Um, so I did do experiments, but really um, uh, the, the actual aim was, was really that it was for yeah. the Soviet space agency to prove to the rest of the world what the, the um, opportunities are in space, how good um, it, it is, uh, the Soviet space agency has become at space flight, human space flight. Um, and then partly as a sort of international collaborative measure, it was partly opening up and it was along the times, you know, coming towards the end of the, the Cold War when Gorbachev wanted to uh, open up to the West as well. So there was a, a lot of sort of undercurrents, I think. Uh, so it wasn't just my flight, there was also um, um, one after me, the Austrians flew and then the Germans flew, the French were there as well. So yeah, there was a lot of Western countries taking part in these uh, missions with the Soviets and then the Russian Space Agency. Wow. What were your jobs on the spacecraft? Whoa, so jobs particularly, um, um, radio control, um, actually in Soyuz, um, I operated a periscopic television camera during the docking, um, which was a manual docking. So when um, we had to sort of see where we were going, or oh, we wow. had to see, um, trying to see what else we had to do. I think there was um, a question of, of moving fluid, um, or some condensate from one part of the, um, from where it was collected to a, to a, a collector, a container um, during the launch, because we get a lot of condensation. So it was sort of little bits and pieces, really. I was sort of, I was a, a filler in. So basically the Soyuz can be flown or could then be flown by a commander and an engineer. They didn't need somebody yeah. um, as a researcher sitting in my seat. But yeah. The fact that I was physically there then <laughs> the commander could do certain <laughs> things. So I had to get, I had to do those things. So they, they weren't, yeah. um, they, they, they weren't, I wasn't actually flying the thing. I was there as a, as a researcher, but nonetheless, so there was, at the time, there were things that, um, that we just had to get on and do. Um, but yeah, so the training was good and, um, and, and, and we were all the time in, in contact, well, all the time. We were, when we needed to be, we were in contact with mission control. Um, at that time, yes. we were only in contact with mission control when we were over the Soviet Union about a third of the orbit, oh. um, because there was no relays, there was no um, satellite communication, it was just direct um, space to ground. So once we got over the east of Russia, there was no contact until we came back round to the west of Russia. <laughs> wow, wow, that's crazy. Um, it's funny to think now, but yeah, for us it was yeah. natural and very normal. And Yeah. yeah um, Do you still keep in contact with the cosmonauts, other, other ones on the mission? Oh, of course. I mean, they, they, they became great friends. And um, yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're still in contact. Yeah. Amazing. How has being in space affected your life on Earth and your perspective about the future of human spaceflight? Because I feel like so few people in the world who have been in space can really understand what that's like. I definitely... Um, reprioritized life so when we look back on earth um you know we we don't think about the physical stuff all that materialism yeah. that um advertising marketing companies um you know that world economy is um, pushing at us all the time um or it was before covid19 came <laughs> yeah exactly but so, so those things are you know they're nice to have but they're not vital and they're not really I, what we need to aim for. I, I just didn't think about those. I didn't think about any of my possessions mm. at all. But when we fly over parts of the earth where we know people, it's those individuals, it's our friends, our families that we think about. And um, I think that really um, made it quite clear to me how important friends and family are, that if you've got all the basics in life, you've got your food and clothes, um, your shelter, I've had a bit of company with my crewmates, what is it that then is really what we need. What is the next most important thing? And I think actually in this, you know, having been in isolation for from our families and friends for a few weeks um, because of the coronavirus, I think many people have had that same opportunity to realise what do they miss most of all? And it's that contact, it's the human relationships, our friends and our family that we really do need most. Yeah, I think that's a really good perspective as well. Um, I think I remember trying to I was, but 
an interview one time said that when you put your whole entire world behind your thumb, I think part of it was demo. It's it changes your perspective. It's like you just don't, you don't you don't think of the objects. You don't think about the cars or how. You just think of people there. Do you think you were more ready to be isolated than others were because you've gone through training? I mean, in COVID nineteen isolation. Do you think during lockdown you're more prepared for it than others because you're went through the training to be isolated? I don't know whether it was the training. I mean, I don't I haven't. I don't mind being indoors, um, but I do yeah. love the outdoors. So, I mean, I love mountains and hills. Um, so, yes, I, if I couldn't go out at all during the day, um, I, I would struggle. Um, and actually now after however many weeks it is, quite a few weeks, more than two <laughs> months, um, I am really wanting to go out and, and feel a bit more free and you know, do a hill walk, and yeah. uh, which I haven't done for a, for a long, long time now. Um, but there we go. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that, yes, I don't mind being in. Now, do I not mind being in because of my time and space mm-hmm. when we know that actually, you know, we're, we're in all the time and there is no possibility of going out? Or actually, is it because, well, I'm that kind of person anyway, um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not a big party animal so I don't miss huge numbers I don't have to go to a rave to feel as though I've really <laughs> myself but I do enjoy being with a few friends yeah. I've missed that now you know we uh, thank goodness for things like zoom and um, all these other um, you know, opportunities that we've got with the connectivity these days that and it's not as remote as it might have been but um, actually my yeah. time in space because we only had the radio then of course so we did have a, um, uh, very occasionally we could have a video link up, uh, but that was really when we were right over TV stations. And most of the time it was just the radio um, and say, and only part time as well. Um, so that, again, that was expected. And, and be, I think it's what we have to just somehow adjust. And I think because the COVID-19 and the isolation, the, the, um, the lockdowns for all of us came very quickly, very few of us had had chance to prepare for that. Um, whereas I prepared for going into space. You know, I thought about it for months. Um, I'd been um, planning it uh, and I actively chose to do it. So that makes it a bit different from, you know, from just being isolated from family and friends all of a sudden, like when you've had to leave all your stuff and you haven't, you know, if you'd known about it, you might have brought your stuff with you and then you... <laughs> yeah, exactly. But on the other hand, you know, I do hope we remember this time. It's not been pleasant, but I hope we remember it for the things that we've learned from it, you know, like, like you're saying about the, um, what's really important to us, what do we need in our life? What is most meaningful? In the long run, but silver lining of it is that we'll appreciate being with people more. Even just now that we're allowed to meet, I think a few friends in the park for events and things like just having a picnic with two of my friends, that was the most meaningful thing I could have had all month. And I was so happy and exciting, but, um, how does it feel knowing that you were a pioneer, not just for women in space, but also for the UK in space? Yeah, if it's, um, I knew, of course, when I applied for it, that that was the reason for the mission. And so there was going to be some sort of notoriety, but I had no idea what that was going to be like. And I applied for very selfish reasons because I just thought it would be fun, you know, the varied training. And if I did get to go into space, well, that would just be an amazing experience. And um, whatever else was going to happen, it was probably worth it for the experience. Um, I had a, what we call minimal um, sort of um, press training that was all, almost zilch, and because um, of course the Russians don't have to do that kind of thing. So um, and then by the time I'd, I'd flown into space, the mission um, it was realised wasn't going to be financially what they thought it was. So very much it was a question of just sort of getting through it and, and everybody else moving on. So um, so yeah, so I wasn't really prepared. I think for uh, for the notoriety or. Um, I certainly didn't know really how to stand up and talk about things, and yet I was somehow expected to. Um, I had no idea I was being put into all sorts of funny situations that um, that I just didn't understand about, like you know, parliamentary space committee. Suddenly, attend a reception for them in the House of Commons. Very nice, but I got you know, I was it was sprung upon me um, within a few day, a few hours' notice. So that morning, and then in the afternoon, that's where I was going, make a speech. Oh. I don't know, but what is the parliamentary <laughs> space committee? If I don't make a speech. I have no idea what do they want to hear about. Um, you know, it's so there's a lot of a lot of that kind of stuff going on. So I found that quite stressful, but it gradually sort of settled down as I became a bit more, I suppose, understanding about the kind of things I wanted to do with what I had done in space. Um, I set up a, a whole series of um, uh, a tour, really, of the, of the UK with different schools, so different regions and their um, their science advisors. Um, basically, created me a little mini tour of the UK, and um, and that really taught me a lot about. Um, how young people might, um, what the kind of things young people could get out of my space flight. You know, the fact that it could be 
inspirational, the fact that the STEM subjects could be you know, enlivened, let's say. Uh, teachers taught me an awful lot about the curriculum. So that was enlightening for me to realise that I, you know, I, I didn't go into space thinking about communicating science, but wow, that was a really good thing, a positive thing that could come out of my mission, even though at the time it was apparent that the UK had no interest in um, supporting human spaceflight um, in terms of like, funding it, taxpayer funding, um, for, for, for many, many years. Um, so it's only recently we, have, we even had a UK space agency. Well, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting how, how recent that has become. But anyway, um, uh, at the time, um, it, it was not so much, um, I realised that very quickly, uh, people generally, the public wanted to find out about my space flight, so I needed to stand up and talk in front of them. Um, that was very weird and very odd to me to start with, but, you know, having done a few of these talks and then listening to, the, to people's feedback and the questions that were, they were asking made me realise that actually then, so we're talking now, what, 25 or so years ago, people were desperate to find out about science. And we didn't have the festivals and, and the science books and the great programmes on TV and radio that we have now. Very few of those kind of things going on. And people just didn't know who to ask, what to ask, but people still wanted to find out. And I think that was also um, a sort of a, a light bulb moment to me, um, that actually the general public were curious um, unlike what I was told by a lot of the media who said oh no 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 the general public don't want to know anything about science they, they won't understand it anyway so we just want to know about what you wore in space and what face cream you put on and um, and tell us about your boyfriend so you know that I what I realized quite quickly was that uh, it was those journalists those type of people who were not understanding what yeah people really were about you know the public there's a huge amount of very intelligent people out there it's just that they for whatever reason given the opportunity or couldn't um uh, couldn't continue with the science studies that they might have otherwise done given given a different life um so yeah so i started yeah. talking about space and talking about science um yeah. presenting bits on tv and um, becoming more of a communicator yeah, yeah. very odd so with that outreach um, how can we all work to inspire the next younger generation of scientists and astronauts and any, everything involved in space? So there's an audience for everybody, I think. Some of us feel more comfortable talking to different age groups, some with very young children, some with no children. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and it varies. Sometimes we might be comfortable in a huge audience. Sometimes we prefer a small audience. Sometimes we prefer the radio when people can't see us at all, but it's just our voice and what we say. So I think it's, if we, it's good to start off in a medium that we, where we feel in a situation that we feel comfortable in. Um, and and then to ask people what it is that they're actually trying to get out of uh, out of a situation. So um, a teacher might say that they want their children just to have um, a fun time so long as science is, is, is involved somewhere. And then that's for us to communicate what we want. Um, so, I mean, I think it, it's, it's important perhaps not to be quite too specific because times will change. It's, um, I think it's important to be passionate about our own subject. That always comes across. Um, but times will change so that perhaps what if you encourage somebody to be specifically an astronaut, say, or um, a, um, I don't know, a, a doctor who works on something very, very particular in the, with, with the human physiology, that may not be available later on to all the young people. But to use those as an examples, possibly, of where people could go, um, but with other opportunities out there as well. So I think, yes, it's start where we feel um, where we feel we've got an opportunity and i would say it's i, I can't imagine a place or uh, where um, anybody could be now um as a, if you're at university or uh, at school where it is not possible to communicate to somebody you know, universities are great at providing opportunities to talk with other fellow students um, also, if we want to, uh, we've got mechanisms of being able to put um, uh, different groups who will help us to get out there and talk to the general public at festivals, at, um, in, in schools, wherever it might be. Um, and yeah, and, and, and university radio programmes, university media studies, um, we can cooperate with them and make, make programmes that they can put out on websites, even if it's just a little two minute YouTube thing. We can all do it. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a great, great way to be able to communicate. Yeah, that's exactly why we started this podcast, because we wanted to communicate science in a way that is more accessible and appealing to university students, making it an informal chat about the space sector without being like babyish TV programs 
or a super serious documentary. You've done quite a few Ask an Astronaut question sessions. Do you have a favorite question that you've been asked or one that stuck out to you? Because I feel like all of them are the same questions over and over again, but is there one where you're like, oh, well, that child was smart, that question. (laughs) That was a smart one. Because we had one where I can't remember what I asked. I remember we had an astronaut come to our school like, when I was, I was 10 and I asked the most detailed engineering question about like the docking system angles and the guy was like I don't know <laughs> like, <laughs> ask like how do you sneeze in space like I don't want to answer this so well, I think it's um it is it's funny so I mean obviously the longer ago it is that you have your space flight um the less of the detail that we remember um so yes I, well, I can't remember all the numbers now about like you say about docking angles and all that kind of stuff and and um the closing velocities and things it's um you know they're kind of they must be there but <laughs> i wouldn't be able to discuss the details of that so yes what, what do i like being asked i suppose i just like being asked something that somebody's really interested in so um if people are asking because they think the editor wants to know then it's you know they're obviously not interested themselves they're going through the motions boring but whoever you are whatever it is you're asking if you are interested then it's a it's a great question, um, and it's it, because it's clear to whoever's being asked of it um, that it's um it's something that that person really wants to know. And then I think it's uh, depending on the um, the age and background of the person. Of course, you'd answer that question in different ways. So um you know I mean probably the hardest questions are from the younger children who are just starting to find out about space. So they'll they'll ask things like, so what does a black hole look like? And then I'm just trying to go, oh, do I just say, well, nothing, it's just black, isn't it? <laughs> or, or do they really want to know something about um, about perhaps what, what does it look like on the horizons? Because they've seen pictures of spaghettification or something. Or perhaps they just want to know about, you know, it, we can tell that black holes are there because that's the st- we can see the stars around them, but we can't see anything after a particular point. So, yeah. Um, I think young children are also often quite um quite worried about things like black holes because they hear about black holes sucking you in um <laughs> and they hear that there's a black hole in the center of our um uh, 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 the milky way and we live in the milky way so that means we're getting sucked into the black hole and oh my goodness and you, you probably won't remember but it's a few years ago when cern all started up in the large hadron collider and we we're all getting very excited oh about yeah them. and every place in the world I was trying to think, this would have been about gosh 10 years ago something like maybe it's a bit more than 10 years ago now even and um and and we were um there were children hanging on to the school railings because they thought that a little mini black hole might be created um if the higgs boson was found or something and and they would get sucked into it so if they held on to the school railings that would stop going into the playtime so we get very confused (laughs) that's hilarious about one thing and yet also on the other hand they what what they really know so i think yeah i don't i honestly don't mind what i'm asked as long as the person asking it is interested in it it really doesn't matter fair enough (laughs) that's sweet how important do you think it is that the uk invests more money in human spaceflight i think we ought to continue investing um we it's such a small amount relative to the amount of money we spend on healthcare, defence, education, mm-hmm. um, and it is going to be part of Britain's future. It will improve our healthcare mm-hmm. in the future and our education Definitely. and our defence probably as well. So I think it's just part and parcel. Um, and we've dipped our toes into the water really with Tim Peake's flight and um, <laughs> with what bits of human space flight the UK Space Agency does do. I know we're getting very excited about um, possible space ports. Um, I, I, I think that was a strategy that we've sort of we've gone down one very very small arm of human space flight um, and if it doesn't really pay off then that, that might be um, a wasted journey let's say so I'd rather us be a little bit broader at the moment um, but nonetheless um, at least we are in there on human space flight and um, we've got some um, sort of lunar gateway projects going haven't we but um, with the European Space Agency hopefully NASA will want to continue with that NASA won't just go it alone completely um, just in order to get American boots on the moon and American boots on um, <laughs> Mars or something um, let's hope that that does become an international venture so um, yes well whether or not Lunar Gateway happens itself I just want Britain and all of us in Britain to have that opportunity to be part of it, whether or not we actually go there, but to feel part of this international stage. And it's it's where you know where the future is for human beings. And I think the last thing Britons and British people need to do is to feel that we're not part of that international future. 
so yeah i think it's really important that we, we we continue to invest and i think i'd like to invest a little bit more and a little bit more broadly and um and, and i think we will rapidly see how much that improves our um, you know, it's, it's good for the economy. Um, it's good for so many other parts of the UK, the science, the research, I say, and eventually um, it'll filter down to healthcare and education as well. Yeah, I actually wrote a paper about all the positive effects stemming from the Apollo missions on the economy and the overall science sector. And it just showed that spaceflight does so much more for the country than we think it does. Well, I'd say go where the opportunities are, to be quite honest. Um, yeah. there's, there are some opportunities and they're increasingly so in the UK, um, especially you know, UK, I mean, broadly, the whole of the UK, not just England. Um, Scotland's been um, has, is invested actually quite heavily in space yeah. and been very in, interested in space um, for a lot longer than England has, I think, <laughs> speaking generally. Um, but now I think you know, the whole of the UK does, does have space opportunities. So you don't have to go away to be involved. But on the other hand, um, you know, I don't think that any of us should set our sights on just the, um, the the confines of you know the state, the nation state that we happen to live in. Um, the world's a much bigger place, um, and you know, the fact that we can make use of opportunities out there. Um, I'm saddened that it may be more difficult um, um, in Europe uh, for British people in the future than it has been up until recently. Um, but I hope we can find some way forward so that um, yeah, we can have um, that, um, that ability to collaborate, to work in other countries um, and to pursue our careers. And, and we really gain, I think, so much um, for ourselves. We understand much more about the rest of the world and how our science, our ideas can fit with that and improve life for everybody and help the country that we do live in, um, that, um, that it seems just crazy not to keep those those borders diffuse and allow us to come and go and, 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 yeah, and use our science for the benefit of everybody. So speaking of future in spaceflight, what are you most excited for in the future of spaceflight? We ask every guest this question. It's kind of my little favorite question to ask. Whoa, so really exciting has to be um, just all the, all the stuff that's, that's, I suppose, that is completely opening up. So um, commercial space flight that will just allow us to, to not to have to go through space agencies always. I think that's really yeah. exciting. Um, um, but what would we want to do? You know, that if we don't have to go through a space agency, you don't have to then make your proposal to do your project and have it vetted and so on by them. Perhaps you, know, you could just go and work for a company that's, uh, that's doing drug design and wants to do a whole load of protein crystals in space. Well, hey, yeah. you know, off you go. <laughs> Go for it. Maybe that person that goes and does those, those that drug stuff in space. Um, but yes, going to Mars has to be you know, an amazing thing, doesn't it? You know, the first people on Mars oh, yeah. and then setting up perhaps a more permanent Mars habitat, really understanding how we can be much more self-sufficient, um, as near to closed loop recycling as we can get. That's, that's really exciting. Um, and you know, the other things that's coming, coming back from um, you know, the, these spacecraft that have gone out to asteroids. So we've got um, the Hayabusa 2 mission from Japan that's going to come back with that sample from Ryugu. You know, woo, so exciting to bring <laughs> Samples that actually this year as well, um, and you know the longer term for that is the possibility of us using those asteroids for um, for materials, and maybe we'll send people to these asteroids as well. Um, so yes, if we're talking just about humans, um, the physical ability of going places, but also what we can see and what we can find out with you know with, with astronomy, and our understanding much more about the universe. Um, and, and our part in all that. Um, for me, this dark matter, well, you know, there's a lot to discover, isn't there? So oh, oh yeah, no, let's, let's, yeah, let's find out about that. And, um, and that, that will tell us, you know, a huge amount. Suddenly, I think we've got, um, we've got a lot to find out. And information will come very quickly. Um, I think because we've found when, you, when we think that actually how much of our understanding of the universe have we gained in only the last 50 years or so? So in our lifetimes, in 50 more years, and yeah, hopefully I will live another 50 years if I'm really <laughs> um, but, um, but that, just looking forward, how much more we're going to find out. It's that it's huge, fantastic. vast set of knowledge and where else that can take us. So yeah, so I'm just excited on so many different levels, I think, for the future of space flight. Um, so it's not probably not really the answer. You can't one answer that I can sort of say, yeah. yes, it's got to be this particular one. But yes, humans will go places. We will know more, um, and we will um, we will improve life on Earth because of it too. It's all it's all part and parcel. I think that's a good 
point to make is that life will improve on Earth when we've left Earth, when we kind of expo not left, but explored the universe a bit more. That's why I always wonder, how can people not be passionate about spaceflight? It's one of my biggest questions in my mind. Okay, black holes, origin of the universe, um, dark matter, and like, why don't people love space? That's kind of my, my question. How do you not love this? This is the best thing in the world because we're exploring the rest of the universe. It's the best. But going back in time, do you have a particular favorite era of spaceflight or anything that really stood out to you? Oh, goodness, that's an interesting one. Um, <laughs> I suppose the big thing for me is has to be Galileo. Um, oh, yeah, true. Right back then. And that, the fact that we are not the center of the universe um, yeah. uh, or the solar system, really. Um, and that um, there isn't necessarily um, a deity that is orchestrating um, the planets, the stars and our everyday lives. So yeah, for me, that, that has to be a sort of a, a really big turning point. Um, we are not the be all and end all of everything. We're just part of this yeah. amazing, vast and beautiful universe. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, what a, to, be, to be the first person to realize that we're not the center is, that's, I can't really think about it now, actually. To stick up for that viewpoint as well, when you know oh, yeah. that, um, that, everything society the church um the state is going to be against you for doing that um yeah so um, i suppose that, and darwin also figures highly in my yeah. in my view because of the same thing yeah exactly all well, as scientists really really make sure that we, we 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 are led by our understanding of the science not what people want us to say how did you deal with the recovery time returning back to earth so was I was only like? in space for eight days. So recovery for me was yeah. very easy, very quick. Fair enough. Um, if you're in the, up there for six months, then yes, you've got bone mass depletion. You've uh, your muscles are weaker as well. Mm. Um, so for me, um, it was feeling a little bit faint to start with, but not hugely. Um, uh, balance a bit affected, but it took about twenty paces for me to get that up and down. And understanding that even though my leg felt heavy, I didn't have to lean over to counterbalance myself and I lived yeah. my leg. <laughs> Fair enough. So I could I could actually just you know just balance that was okay um yeah that was I think that was pretty much it really balance bit of faintness um uh and if, yeah the the it was more I suppose the than the sudden onslaught of so many people and everybody wanting to have a bit of my time and a bit of me physically mentally um not you know not really owning myself anymore for a while that was a more of a kind of a an adjustment phase but then yeah but the actual physical getting back to normal that, that's the easy bit yeah yeah fair enough what was the hardest aspect of training Oh, learning Russian has to be. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. As for a scientist, learning Russian, although I love languages, uh, but I think it was partly because we were just sort of dropped mm -hmm. in at the deep end. A uh, Russian teacher didn't speak any English. Um, uh, it was all a bit, um, yeah, a bit surreal and, um, uh, and intense. Uh, but yeah. there we go. So the quickest way to learn, isn't it? So, yeah, and I'm grateful for it now. Um, but yes, it was um, learning Russian. Once you've learned Russian, then the, the rest was you, you just have to listen and ask questions and and learn and understand yeah. and you know what's that, that that was fine that was i wasn't being asked to do anything um sort of a nobel laureate kind of <laughs> level it was all fair enough you know, fairly <laughs> basic stuff i just had to get on and do it you know yeah that's the i think one of the reasons why i wouldn't be able to be an astronaut is i can't do languages i didn't even do language cheesiest i yeah that's I respected i just could not do that um but do you have any tips for astronaut training for any future want to be astronauts i'm um, just en enjoy the the variety of, of skills that yeah. you can employ i suppose um different different jobs of astronauts will require different training but i think yes basically the the, the bottom line is be a good team player so if you want to get involved in it, just enjoy doing lots of different things that involve different ways of working with different types of people um, so that you understand yourself and how to uh, interact in different circumstances. Um, and yeah, and then the training just um, is just then a, a sort of a relatively easy progression of that because you will naturally just slot into it. Um, mm. Besides speaking Russian, are there any other um, skills that you learned that are still handy to this day that you've still are just useful random things you've learned yeah. being an astronaut in training? They're like, oh, I can do this now because I was an astronaut. I'm trying to think what it would be. Um, cross country <laughs> skiing. <laughs> was, well, yeah, that enough. to be quite honest. Um, <laughs> uh, I spent more time on my bottom than I did actually on the ski. So it wasn't very yeah. good as training. 
um, I try to think what else we um, we actually did. So I think it was just a lot of um, it, it would be that understanding of of the, um, of the community and yeah. how a community can be very supportive of its members um, and and trusting as well. So I don't think I'd ever really completely trusted any of my colleagues before I'd never had to mm. um, so that understanding okay. that yes you can trust people people will trust you and together actually you can achieve so much so coming from a sort of a having done a levels my degree and then worked in industry in industry I'd worked in teams but still um, those roles are very defined you have job descriptions and it's sort of you know what your mm. role is with it within the team but still it's and being an astronaut is a bit more diffuse and then say so more generally being part of this astronaut community means that I know now if um, if one of them asked me to do something I, I would say yes I wouldn't have to question their motives uh, yeah. I, will, I would be supportive of them and I know they would be supportive of me so it's it's a nice community to be in so, yeah, so we can, I think that's probably it is that we can um, with trust um, when you have to you have to build up that trust of course but with trust and um, in a kind of community like that um, you can relax and really enjoy doing a whole load of things that you might not otherwise have had the opportunity to do. That's amazing. What was your favorite moment of the kind of the post spaceflight tour? I don't know how was that. What's it called? Kind of like once you're back, what was the most surreal moment? You meet someone you're really excited to meet, or um, was there one moment where you really enjoyed that? Um, so yes, I didn't really have a sort of a tour as as many astronauts do because they they their space yeah. agents will organise. Um, often yeah. it can last for a year after their space flight and just communicating yeah. about it. But um, um, I think really it was it, it it was going into a specific school, having a teacher really explain to me some of those real basic things like when you're giving a talk, don't just talk louder, talk lower as well. That helps your voice a lower register it's your voice but it's easy to listen to and and talk to people as though they are your friend just there you're you might be talking to 500 of them in an assembly but actually each one of them wants to listen to you not because they're one of 500 but because they are them so i think it was that um sort of a little light bulb moment for me and i really enjoyed um that particular school and that particular teacher um, and the children there who of course now will be much older but they were they yeah. were telling me the kind of things that they enjoyed so it's um yeah not a very good answer for you I'm afraid but it's um no that's good it's kind of it was the moment that you're like wow that's you learn how to public speak that's yeah. cool <laughs> like, I can't public speak I'm really glad this is like pre-recorded I can edit anything I want out of this I can record bits I have the, I am don't do public speaking because I'm yeah, it's not my thing. I would have said exactly the same at your age. And in fact, even up to the age of 26 before I went into space, no, I don't do public speaking. Um, I am a scientist. I work in a lab. Yeah. Certainly look at me and you know, everything will be fine. But there we go. You, 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 when you need to, sometimes we push ourselves out of that comfort zone and actually realise, and you know, now I do enjoy it. I really, yeah, yeah, really. I still am an introvert. Oh. I really do enjoy public speaking. Thank you all so much for listening to today's episode with Helen Sharman. This was honestly such a surreal and exciting episode for me to record and a fantastic conversation. So thank you. Be sure to check out our websites, spacecareers.uk and uksets.org for all the latest careers information and other news going on in the space world. Be sure to join me Thursday at five in two weeks time. Bye everyone. Time is X minus 10, nine,